A cup double looked in prospect when Dundee made good progress in the Scottish Cup, meeting third Lanark in the semi. At Easter Road, Dundee and Darkshaw beat third Lanark by two goals to nil to pass into the final. Christie sent over a beauty and Burrell made no mistake to put Dundee one up. After some general play, Dundee went further ahead when Billy Steele got a chance and made it 2-0. Well, in 1952, uh, we got to the final of the Scottish Cup and that, that was the uh, time when we played in front of 130-odd thousand people. 134 or 137, I'm not sure. And obviously, that's... Uh, very excitable time uh, going out and seeing this crowd because while Dens Park was normally well attended, it wasn't in this category. So it was a wee bit nerve wracking, I'll put it mildly. But uh, you've just got to get over these things, and uh, we didn't get over it all together, so we got to be poor nothing. But uh, nevertheless, we were, in a sense, a wee bit. Uh, Unlucky in the first half. Centre forward Flavel shoots, but Kilmarnock kicks off the line to save a certain goal. That's the first of three saves by Willie. Here comes another. Plenty of thrills, but no score is the report at half-time. All credit to Motherwell. They deserve to win in the end. But uh, it's always something that you play in a cup final in front of 130-odd thousand people. Uh, it doesn't happen every week, we'll put it that way. That October, the Dark Blues returned to Hamden for the third time in a year, retaining the League Cup after defeating Kilmarnock 2-0. We didn't play so well that day. We never played so well that day, but fortunately, we had a good defence, and we held out. And then a couple of long balls down the middle, and Bobby Flavel put two in the net, and we won 2 nothing. But we were a wee bit fortunate that day. But still, to retain the trophy at that time for a provincial team like Dundee took a bit of doing. In 1953, a second round Scottish Cup tie against Rangers attracted a Dens Park record crowd of over 43,000. Dundee were determined to break the Rangers' recent impressive run of victories, but although they started many attacks, they just couldn't make it. In the second half, Dundee was on the attack again, but they still couldn't pierce the Rangers' defence. Then Rangers counter-attacked, and that spelled disaster for the home team. Hubbard put in a low drive to open the scoring, and before Dundee had time to realise what had happened, Rangers had done it again through Grierson. Rangers thus pass into the third round. Hard luck, Dundee. After their cup successes, Dundee were very much a team in demand, and their close season tour that year was to the exotic destination of South Africa. It was supposed to be Dundee. Initially, it was the SFA that were going. But George Anderson, clever man, uh, I think it was a question of we would fulfill their obligations. And that's how Dundee got to South Africa. We played 17 matches, won 15, uh, lost one and drew one. And that included three... I call football matches, test matches, just as they do cricket. So we, won, we got beaten one of the test matches at Durban, but we won the other two, one at Johannesburg and one in Cape Town. So, and we scored 70 goals and 12 against. Not bad. Following a memorable and successful South African safari, the great team broke up, and the mid-50s was a major transitional period for the Dark Blues. Scottish international left half Doug Cowie was to become a key figure. The team was the team was changing at that time. We lost a lot of good players, you know. And in '54, I think we lost about uh, we lost Cowan, Frew, Zising, Flavel, Steele. Uh, that's a nucleus of a great side, really. We lost all them. Or, uh, we were re renewing the team. Fortunately, I was maybe still left to help the players that were maybe coming in, you know. So there was a few good players coming there that Thornton had uh, uh, got from the scouts, you know, like Gilzine, 
cousin, uh, Bobby Cox, uh, I think he got uh, Hamilton as well, Andy Penman, I thought was a great player. And uh, I was lucky enough to play with these players. Fortunately, Bobby and Cousins and them, they came in and they played right away, you know, without being seasoned too long in the reserves. They came in and played right away, and of course, the more games they played, the more they gelled together. And like a good side, they turned into a really good side. Bob Shankly became manager in 1959 and inherited this rich vein of young players. Bobby Cox was skipper of that Dundee side who remembers the Shankly years with great pride. Bob Shankly was a, was a hard taskmaster. He, he wanted things right. And uh, as far as the coaching and that left, uh, went, he, he left it to Sammy. Sammy came, did all the coaching. Bob came up, student, uh, took part in watched what was going on, things like that. But Bob Shankly was a wonderful player. Great, great manager. Anything that Bob Shankly told us to do or, or to work out or something like that, it seemed to be in agreement with other players. The player was in agreement with everything that Bob Shankly did. Bob sort of came in with a new broom, swept out a lot of people who had been here for years and really weren't going anywhere. Gave youth a chance and I think, it was, I think it was the advent of Bob Shankly that, that, that made the transformation. He was the, he was the, the man behind it all. He was, a, he was just a terrific manager. He just got the best out of everybody, and I think that's what managers are all about. They get the very best out of, out of you know, players. Everyone was afraid of him, but it was a fear born out of respect, and he could uh, put you down with a sentence. You know, if you were big-headed or shouting the odds, he would say, listen, son, if you're ever at Wembley, you'll be wearing a tammy, you'll not be in the pitch. And managers are supposed to be positive in their, uh, in their support. You know, the psychologists say, positive affirmation. He used to say to me, put his hand on my shoulder and say, nothing clever from you today, son. And when he was doing the team group photograph, you knew how well you were placed. If you were Ian Ewer or Bobby Cox or Alec Hamilton, Alan Gilzean, Gordon Smith, you were in the middle of the photo. The less good players were put at the sides, and he would say to me, and maybe my pal Doug Houston, he'd say, Houston, you sit at that end, Brown, you sit at that end, a pair of scissors will get rid of you two. So you knew <laughs> by your positioning in the photograph eh, what, have he thought, what he thought of you. And there's a significant one with Ian Muir because Ian would re-sign one, uh, one year and Ian was banned from the photograph, very strict. No player was bigger than the club and Shankly ruled that club. Uh, I would have thought majestically he was a magnificent football manager. Bob Shankly's sound judgment was to mould a team that went on to take the league title and reach the European Cup semi-final and Scottish Cup final. No, I think uh, the strength of the Dundee team was consistency of selection and the talent identification qualities of Bob Shankly. He picked players. He didn't go out and sign expensive players, but he picked players for the job. And his most significant signing, I think, was to bring back Gordon Smith, who had already won two championships with uh, Hibernian and with Hearts. And at age 35, I think, he brought Gordon Smith. Now, everyone, but everyone, respected the gay Gordon, the wonderful uh, winger. And his crosses to the head of Alan Gilzean were instrumental in many goals for Dundee. But they had an, ex an excellent spine in the team, right through the middle of the team. They had uh, Ian Ewer in the heart of the defence. Always solid goalkeeping. Pat Linney, when they won it, uh, Bert Slater, the next year. But then we had Bobby Seath in midfield, excellent, controlling the game there on the right side of midfield, and up front, uh, Gilzean and Cousin, and of course two wingers in those days, uh, outside right, Gordon Smith, outside left, Hugh Robertson, and the team was very, very well balanced. Tough, quick fullbacks, Alec Hamilton, Bobby Cox, and Bobby Wishart, a brain in midfield, excellent passer of the ball, and of course the old inside forwards, that they had Alan Cousin, could get forward from there, and Andy Penman, magnificent passer of the ball. So the whole team was beautifully balanced, excellent athletes as well as footballers, and they were, believe me, dedicated. They trained really, really hard, but I've got to say also they played hard, they, they enjoyed themselves. And it wasn't, a, I would say, a teetotal team by any stretch of the imagination, but prior to matches and in preparation for matches, they were extremely conscientious. The 1961-62 league campaign got off to a great start. 
Nine wins from the first ten games, putting Dundee three points clear at the top. Now they faced a major hurdle when they journeyed to Ibrox. At half-time, I think it was nothing each. Uh, and then in the second half, the fog got progressively worse. I mean, really, I don't think the game should have been played because I don't think people at one end of the park saw the goals at the other end. I could barely see it. I could just see us attacking into the mist and players coming back, throwing their arms in the air. So I said, oh, we've scored again. And so it went on. And, and we only won 5-1. Uh, and that was a great day, and that was a big turnaround in the league. By late January, the team lay eight points above Rangers, after being unbeaten for 18 league games. But again, we, we went and we, we blew it again in the early months of that following year. You know, the, the January, February period. I don't think we won a game out of it, six games. And I think the slump coincided, perhaps, with an injury to Bobby Wishart. And Bobby Wishart came into the, uh, came out the team, and I came in. And unfortunately, you know, when I got a few games uh, in the middle of the season, we drew at Kilmarnock, then we got a thumping. Patrick Thistle beat us three nothing, which was uh, a disaster in the campaign. Rangers overtook us, I think, but they went three points ahead, I think, at one point. And everyone said, "Oh, it's all over again." Then Dio, blown it. The wee team has blown it. We then beat St Mirren. Now St Mirren were a good side at the time. And we managed to beat St Mirren uh, in the penultimate game. They were one nothing up, and St Mirren were awarded the penalty. About 15 minutes to go, and there was a great hoo-ha about it. And the referee, who was Willie Syme, David Syme's father, went and consulted the linesman. And I travelled down in the car with him after the game. He said, what did you can consult the linesman for? Well, it was a clear penalty. And he said they consulted them because Gordon Smith protested, and I've never known Gordon Smith to protest about a decision in his life. Uh, it was a very happy ending. The, the penalty was missed and Dee ran straight down and Andy Penman scored a blinder just as the news came through from Pittori that Rangers were 1-0 down. And that was pretty well it. From three points down, we were back in with a shout, you know, and, and we took it from there. And, and of course the final match was uh, St Johnston at Perth. St Johnston needed a draw to stay up, to stay in the Champions. And we didn't know whether the Rangers game, what was going to go on at Aberdeen with the Rangers Aberdeen, so it was a must that we got the, the two points there. On that blazing hot day in April, the Dark Blues needed only a point from their game with relegation threatened St Johnson. After 24 minutes, Gordon Smith crossed to Alan Gilzean, who headed home to send the travelling support into a frenzy of anticipation. It's the bold boys who wear the dark blue old Dundee. Sensing that the title was now within their grasp, Dundee settled into their stride. Alan Gilzean added to his tally 59 minutes into the game, after running on to a long ball from Alex Hamilton. It was his 27th goal of the season. Oh, there's Robertson, Penman and Alan Gilzean With Hasson and Smith, they're the finest you've seen A defence that is steady, heroic and sure Linny Hamilton, Coxie, then Wishart and York To crown the triumph, eight minutes later Andy Penman crashed home a shot off the crossbar to put the team into an unassailable lead And with Rangers only drawing their game with Kilmarnock Dundee had marched into history, winning the championship by a clear three-point margin. I never forget it. That was just the. I think it. I think it still remember, uh, remains the greatest day I ever had in football. Uh, the feeling was just euphoric. It was absolutely unbelievable. It was the most wonderful day. I was gloriously drunk at night. It was just a fantastic, a fantastic event. I remember winning at Wembley in 1962. Was it? Was a was a famous day when we beat England with two with, with ten men. That was a wonderful feeling. But I don't think anything compares with that that day at Mewton. You know, the, the the night we had, the the just the just the sheer joy of it all. It was wonderful. With the domestic title in the bag, the Dark Blues qualified for the following year's European Cup, 
and once again hit the heights with a string of impressive performances against top continental opposition. FC Cologne were to be the first victims. The Dundee Championship side was certainly good enough to win the European Cup the following year and probably should have won the European Cup the following year. Real Madrid, they were the favourites and they got put out in the first round. And Cologne went to favourites, they were the favourites for the time, for them to win it. And they came up here and we thrashed them up here.